So this one was suggested to me because a friend of mine is um, wanting to make small heaters out of uh, my conductive ink. And um, when I say small heaters, I mean small heaters, tiny things. And she's having a bit of trouble. So I thought I'd go through some of the uh, bits and pieces you need to think about when uh, making a heater and make a heater, obviously. So I'm gonna make quite a large heater. Actually, the one that I'm making is this one here, this hot plate heater. So it's quite large, but the same ideas hold true for however um, big or small you want to make the heater uh, and whatever substrate you want to put the heater on. You have to remember, of course, you're heating something, so <coughs> you have to control the heat. Is if you put it onto a bit of cloth and heat it above the um, flame point of the cloth, the flash point of the cloth, you're uh, obviously gonna create a danger and the same thing with paper. Now, you, you can heat anything to um, whatever degree you want, really. You just have to do it in a controlled way. So, you know, don't try to heat a piece of plastic up to a thousand degrees or you'll be sorry. What you want to do is, is have um, reasonable control. Now, um, heating, or, or the majority of heating, is actually um, done by something called dual heating. Uh, dual heating is also known as resistive heating or ohmic heating, but dual heating is, is really what it is. And you see dual heating all over the place. It's in the kettle, it's in your iron, and it's in a toaster. So what is in a toaster? Well, if you take the lid off a toaster, it's actually an astonishingly simple machine. All you actually have is um, your lead here, a little bit of electronic control gubbins here, and this thing here. And this thing is a big old wire wrap of nichrome wire. And nichrome wire is good because nichrome wire actually has a high resistance. And this is one of the reasons it's called resistive heating, is because the resistance of a material actually uh, affects how well it's going to heat. And the only other things we've got in here is a little lever that operates a tiny switch here to um, get the current through to the wire, and a tiny bit of control electronics. And all this does is um, turn it off and on. There's a little push button there to make the thing pop up. That's a little electromagnet that actually goes there to draw it down and to hold it down. And when it turns off, that's how it pops up because it's doing it against the spring and this electromagnet. There's a tiny little heating sensor in here. It'll be a biometallic strip sensor. So when it gets too hot, that strip will open up. It'll close off the current to the uh, electromagnet. That will turn off and the whole thing will pop up. So it's a simple control. It's only just a, a, a heating element and electromagnet with the power fed straight into a resistance wire. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about the theory. Okay, so dual heating is actually a heating where the um, particles jiggle across each other and it's the rubbing of the particles, if you like, and it's usually electrons, but not always. And that rubbing is what creates dual heating. Now the fundamental expression of dual heating is this. P equals IV, and where P is actually your measurement of power. Now, power in this case is a measurement over time, and it's uh, measured in joules, hence joule heating. Uh, the watt, incidentally, is one joule per second, and we all, we all have a familiarity with watts. You can think of a 700 watt heater. Um, but the standard SI unit is joules, so the power in joules is equal to the current that you let through times the voltage drop. across the really, uh, resistive element that you're using as a heater. Now we don't often measure um, voltage drop. You know, can do, you can measure the voltage in, measure the voltage out, you can calculate it, you can work out voltage drop, but we don't often do that. What we want it in is, is some kind of expression of um, resistance, something that we can easily measure using our own meter. And, and this is where Ohm's law comes in, and hence uh, why it's also called ohmic heating. Now, when I was at school, I learned Ohm's law like this. V I R. We've got a little triangle, and you read it as volts equals current times resistance, or uh, current equals volts divided by resistance, or resistance equals volts over current. So you just work your way around the triangle to come up with these various expressions. Now, obviously, we can take these expressions and drop them straight into this here. So if we take that one and drop it in, what we get is our power as being equal to um, I squared R. So we can find it now in terms of a resistance figure, which is kind of really helpful. Or we can take um, our current one, and we can drop it straight in there, and we get it as equal to V squared 
and R. So we can get it as the square of the voltage times resistance as well. That is the voltage that we're applying on there. Have I got that the right way around? Sorry, V squared divided by R. And so given um, figures that we actually have, we can actually work out what kind of power relationship, what kind of heating we're going to have for any particular resistor that we happen to be using. So let's have a look at the elements of our toaster. And what we have with our toaster, we had our power in and it came to its little circuit board where it was really just distributed via a switch. And the switch was the lever, it operated two little copper strips. That switch then went directly to the nichrome coil, and the nichrome coil, remember, had the push button down where it was held on by an electromagnet. So we have our electromagnet, and that electromagnet was controlled by a bimetallic strip, feeding straight into the power, obviously. The bimetallic strip, so when it got hot enough, the strip would open, the electromagnet would turn off, this would pop back out, and the popping out would um, turn off this switch here, and the whole thing would go off. So that's all there was to the toaster, nothing else. That's your control circuit, that's your on-off switch, and it was operated by a mechanical lever that either opened or closed that switch, nothing else to it. So, let's measure the resistance here. If we measure that resistance across there, and we have something like, I don't know, 200 ohms, we measure that resistance at 200 ohms. Now we know where our voltage is. Our voltage is 230 volts because we're operating it in the UK. If you're operating in the US, it's 110 volts. I think most of Asia works on 120 volts. But that's how you operate it on there. Now we can take these two figures so we can calculate our power consumption. And our power consumption, given that we've got these two figures, would be V squared over R. So we square the voltage and we'll get about... Uh, what would that be? 52,000? About 52,000, 53,000, somewhere around about there. And then we divide it by our resistance, two, divide by two, and we get about 250, kilo, uh, 250 watts, about a quarter of a watt, something like that, okay? So we can calculate the power that this thing will um, actually take. So now there's another element of it that you need to consider and that is um, that we're going to put this thing into a fixed power supply. It's, it's a wall unit or a battery unit or something like that. And we need to consider our Ohm's law again. So our Ohm's law, remember, is V equals IR. Now, if we have a voltage of 230 volts and we put that across a resistance of 200 ohms, we divide one by the other, we get the current that we're actually going to draw. So we get uh, 1, 2, 1 1.1. So that's going to draw 1.15 amps. And of course, that's no problem there, that's fine. But let's say we reduce our resistance down to 20 ohms, then that's going to be 11.5 amps. It's quite a lot. If we reduce that down to 2 ohms, we're going to be getting 115 amps through that resistor. That's a hell of a lot of power to be whacking through a resistor. And obviously as we keep going down by factors of 10, and it's not too difficult to go down by factors of 10 incidentally, I mean a length of copper wire about that long is going to have an insignificant resistance. And that of course is exactly how fuses work. You put in a short wire that has a really low resistance, so that given a fixed voltage and given a fixed resistance, it will draw a certain ampage across that wire. And if that ampage is high enough, that wire is going to melt. And that's how a fuse works. It allows too high a current to go through, melts the wire, breaks the circuit, and it's done. So as your resistance goes down, your current is going to go up. Now, if you increase that current too much, then it's going to exceed um, the ability of the material to handle that current draw. And you need to pay attention to that, particularly that, when you're designing these things. So you need to think about um, what kind of power is it going to draw? What kind of current is it then going to draw? Okay, so this is a demonstration heating model, and what it is is uh, a bit of uh, stone. It's actually a stone tile, gra uh, a granite tile. And what I've done is I've put two strips of this stuff. It's copper, copper tape. And I just glued the copper tape down on either side like that. 
and then I painted over the top of it with some of my magic ink, some of my conductive ink. Now, you have to play around with the resistance figures of this. This conductive ink is actually pretty conductive. So if you slap it on there in a thick old coat, you're not going to get much resistance. What you need to do is play with it. And you reduce the resistance just by adding water, thin it out. The thinner it gets, the less actual conductive particles are there, and so the higher the resistance. So this has been watered down 25% of ink to 75% of water, painted on there, left to dry, and it forms a very thin film. And the thin film is not particularly conductive. Now, because it's a point-to-point -point conduction, and it's um, actually pretty much a square, then if you just painted this ink on, you're going to get the same kind of uh, res square resistance that we got in the um, sheet resistance testing of this stuff that we did in an earlier video. That is, it's going to be about 30 ohms. So we need to uh, muck around with that. Now, I thought, well, 30 ohms, okay, I want it about 120 ohms. Let's put in 75% water and 25% ink should get round about right. And as it happens, we do. So if I measure the resistance of that, then the resistance across those two is, uh, yeah, it's about 120 ohms. So I've got 120 ohms resistance on that. Now, as a demonstration, my plan is to put in 12 volts. So I'm going to put in a 12 volt um, power supply. Now, at 120 ohms and 12 volts, the kind of current that's going to go across there using your Ohm's law is going to be about 0.1 amps. It's a tiny amount. And if we use our dual heating formula, we can work out that it's actually going to be about 1.2 watts. So we've got a really low power heater here. It's not drawing much current. It's not going to get particularly hot. But I'm doing it on the kitchen worktop. I don't want it to heat to a thousand degrees in two seconds flat, or I'll be in trouble. So if I connect that up, the current flow and resistance of that is going to cause this area to heat up. And of course, that's what we want it to do. We're making a heating element. So if I measure the temperature of the surface of that, okay, so my current temperature read, uh, reading is 21 degrees. So the temperature of that is currently 21 degrees. And just leave that to warm up. Now, because the draw is so low, then the heating is going to be actually quite, quite slow. Actually, it's not doing too bad. It's a 21.7 at the moment. Twenty-one point eight. So it is beginning to heat up, but by a small amount. Obviously, you won't actually use something like this in this way. It's just a test. And you can see my hand hovering over it. I don't really want to touch it because that's live. If I stick my hand on there, it's going to be just like putting a fork in my toaster. We all know not to put our forks in our toasters. It's live. Huh? Um, so you need some kind of protection on that. Now, for this kind of thing, what would be good protection would be capped on tape. Kept on tape has a heat resistance to about 400 degrees and um, a resistance to electrical current in the region of, I think it's about 5 kilovolts per 0 0.006 mil thickness. So it's a hell of a, a resistance to passive current and a really good heat resistance. So you'd use a bit of kept on tape on it or something like that. Actually, um, <coughs> that's what the kept on looks like. Uh, you get it in all kinds of sizes. This is uh, 20 centimeters. So you can see what it's like, it's sticky backed and, and that's the Kapton just there. So you'd lay a bit of Kapton tape across there and that will give you an idea uh, of how you would actually go about protecting yourself from both electric shock and heat. But there's an awful lot of things you could put on there. You could put a bit of mica or you could put a bit of ceramic, anything really. If you put another stone on there, then both of these stones would heat up. Um, actually, that would be a really good way of making a radiator and it would also protect you. That's actually, that's actually got to 22. Now, 22.1 in fact, now 22.2. So, heating up nicely, nice and slow. It'll continue to heat until these batteries drain, incidentally. It'll, it'll get up there. Uh, if we put insulation on there, it will get even hotter. But um, given the power draw that it's got and the fact it's in the ambient temperature, that's actually gonna to get to, oh, 30, 40 degrees, and it's gonna take a couple of hours to do that. And it, <laughs> it won't get particularly hot, actually, because it's 12 volts, you can, in fact, just touch it because it's such a low voltage just going through there. Now, there's another example of a heating sheet that I've made. This one's flexible, as it happens. But it's the same process. It's um, two copper strips, um, capped on, actually, and a, a layer of this stuff, and you just flex it around.
Now, ideally, of course, what you'd want to do is plug this into the mains. Now, if you're going to plug it into the mains, you, you can't plug it in just like this. This is just a, a, a really um, simple setup. You want some safety devices in there. But you can get them easily enough. Uh, this is actually a temperature controller. Then it comes with a thermocouple. Uh, you pop the thermocouple in the middle, attach it to your, uh, your uh, temperature controller, and you can set your temperature controller. A temperature controller leads to something like this, and this is a sort of con controlled um, switch, basically. So you put your high voltage and your wall voltage in here, you put your um, temperature controller in here, and the temperature controller, in the same way that the toaster had the mechanical switch, this is an electric switch, the temperature controller will turn this switch off and on, which will alter the supplies read by the th uh, thermostat. So the thermostat gets too hot, it, the uh, temperature controller will turn this off and you'll stop your supply. Then it'll begin to cool down and so on. It'll heat and cool using a little bit of control circuitry. So if you're going to plug this thing into the mains, obviously, <laughs> don't just do it. You'll probably blow the mains. Now, uh, particularly if you don't thin it down, if you've got something like 20 ohm sheet resistance on that and you bang it straight in the main mains, you're guaranteed to flip your house switches. Uh, so put in some control circuitry. Pay attention to the resistance that you have across the two electrodes that you're using. And that is how you go about making a uh, heating unit out of this stuff. Anyway, I hope that helped, particularly my friend. And uh, if you enjoyed watching it, then please feel free to contribute to my Indiegogo campaign, which is uh, down in the description bar. So thank you very much.